the story goes that uh, last year, our extension plan path, Larry Osborne, some of you know him, uh, <coughs> left. <laughs> and he asked me to, uh, to take over uh, the SCN study. We've been doing this SCN study. I think this is the fifth, I thought, if not the sixth year that we, we do it out here, but and before that we've done SCN studies out here. Uh, what we are trying to look at is the effect of uh, resistant and susceptible varieties and also seed treatment. So eventually we're gonna, we're gonna go there. Uh, but before that, um, uh, let's start with anybody has problem with soybean cyst nematode in their soybean fields in here? You do? Have you, have you checked it? Do you know? Yeah, I said you sent it to the lab. How did it go? How did it come out? What kind of number? Well, I mean, they weren't crazy numbers. I mean, okay. I think the highest I had was like 220. Okay. Well, that's that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. But but you know that you have that yep. that in there. Why did you uh, chose to send a sample in? Did you, did you see any problem? You just want to know? Yeah. Well, every time I was pulling samples in the fall, I was peeling off soil and sending it in. All sure. So I did a composite on the field. Or yeah. Yeah. I was doing zone sampling. I was doing it on zone. And Good job. Yeah. Did you see any any anything weird with your beans that prompted you to think that I well, might I'm, have problem I used with to that? Work or in Turner County, I used to see the weird things, but where I'm at now, um, no, I didn't. You didn't? Yeah. I just wanted to know. Sure. Yeah. And that's 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 a really good thing because in a good year, in a in a year where you have enough moisture, enough water, and everything else is going good, you don't see the difference between a plant that got hammered by SEN and the one that, that doesn't. Last year, uh, out here, um, I also ran the same study and it made for an interesting demo because I'll be taking people out and showing them, all right, this one has SEN, that one doesn't. It look exactly the same. <laughs> Just look cuckoo, <laughs> that, that's, that's all. But, but that, that is, for me, one of the biggest message for SEN. In a good year, you probably do not see above ground symptoms. And that gives it that you know silent killer kind of kind of thing, um, because even though you don't see the any symptom, it, it's still taking off your yield. It's still taking off five to ten percent of your yield, even though it doesn't show any any symptoms. It's uh, soybean cyst nematode. It's, it's a nematode. It's basically a, a very tiny worm. Uh, SEN is is interesting because. The female, which is what we are going to focus on, uh, are round, lives entirely inside the roots. Um, <coughs> you know, it starts as eggs, as, as any animal, almost any animals, in any case. Um, and then hatches, the, the juvenile are very, very small, won't be able to see with bare eyes, grew up uh, into adult. First, the females will stay completely inside the roots, start feeding inside their roots. You can't see it. But about now, they started to be too big to be contained within the roots. You can almost see it erupting out of the roots. They're still pretty small at this point, but we'll be, hopefully, uh, yesterday we tried to dig any number of roots and we can't find anything. <laughs> but this morning we were lucky enough and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to see uh, some of those. They're not as big as this yet, but you'll be able to see some of the female ASEAN, uh, so you've been seeing nematode coming out of the roots. Um, and that, that erupting out of the root business, of course it opens up you know, wounds for other pathogens, fungal pathogens, to, to infect that root. You, know, you name it, Rhizoctonia, Fusarium, uh, I think brown stem rot, even though it's not a root disease, but that, that also came in with, uh, with so you've been seeing nematodes. Uh, one thing, one other thing that I like to, to tell people about SEN is that um, unlike insect, insect problems is like cough in, in human disease parlance. You, know? uh, you, you get a cough, you take a, a cough medicine, it's gone for this year and hopefully you don't get it again until next year or again whoever, uh, until uh, whenever. Uh, so you can, you can take something and it'll be gone. SEN is more like an allergy. If you, an, if you have an allergy, uh, it stays with you. <laughs> you uh, for the most part, you can't scrape it. You can't you know, get rid of it. But you can manage your allergy so that it doesn't flare up. Right? SEN is like that. Once you have it in your field, you probably have it forever. Uh, there's, there's nothing that we know of right now that we can apply to a field and eliminate the SEN problem. But there are things that you can do to manage the population to stay low. 
So that's the good news. Um, how do you do that? Well, it starts with sampling. It starts by knowing whether you have that problem in your field or not. And there is, there is no substitute to, to do that but to start either pulling roots out or the best thing is taking uh, soil samples and sending it to, to, uh, to a lab. Uh, and, and we happen to have a really good lab that does that. Uh, this year is still for free. Well, it's paid for, and I'll, I'll let, I'll let uh, Connie um, talk more about that. Let's go out there um, so that we can talk a little bit about the plot that we have and also about sampling procedures. Uh, this field, been, we've done SEN research for the last 10 years or so, so it's, it's hot. It's probably one of the hottest fields uh, for soybean cyst nematode in the whole state. Uh, so we don't want you to walk in there, walk out, and bring SEN to your fields. <laughs> we have um, disposable boots that we would like you to uh, to put on uh, so that so that we can we can take precaution there. Do they recommend how many years they recommend staying out of beans? Three, four years, but three, four? Uh, <clears throat> over ten thousand. Yeah. It's probably longer. I'm just saying that there is pockets, you know, obviously that are over ten thousand. There is there is information in the literature that shows that after ten years you still have that that soil. Well, I mean, you're still gonna have a Yeah, but it it will it will go down. Yeah. After three, four years, it will go down. Like five, six years? Yeah. This is our the test plots. Normally, when you walk out and look in a field, if we've had a really wet year, you're not going to see a lot of difference in the soybeans. If you have SCN or, you know, in the areas that don't have it, um, sometimes it, they'll, they'll be a little bit shorter maybe, you know, not a lot. Maybe they didn't canopy in all the way. Just, it's not always an obvious difference. Sometimes those symptoms can look like a nutritional problem. All right, you're starting to see some yellowing in this area. It, you know, maybe you're thinking a little iron deficiency, potassium, something like that. Maybe you're seeing more disease in that area. SCN, when it chews on those roots and starts to go in, it also makes an opening for things like Phytophthora, brown stem, sudden death, Rhizoc. So you start to see a little more diseased areas. This year is really nice. With the drought, we are actually seeing really good symptoms. These rows right here where the, the soil core is, those are susceptible varieties, okay? And you can obviously see the difference in height, size, color, from the healthy to the, the infected. Um, I've <laughs> had a hard time digging in this field. This thing's like a rock. So I, I finally got enough watered in. Let's see if I can pull this back out, lose my mic, carry on. Oh, let's see. On these, you can actually see the cyst. You want to pass that around? Sure. There's only two ways to know if you have really have cyst nematode in your field. Okay, one is about this time of year, July into August, you can go out, actually start digging some plants, looking for that cyst on the root. By now, she's big enough you can find her. Mm, maybe. Maybe you washed it out. <laughs> the bad thing is this year, um, the ground is so hard, if you're not careful when you dig it out and loosen that soil, you'll actually knock her right off of there. Maybe it's just too muddy to see. Is there any race five? document in this area? I don't know. Oh, okay. I honestly don't know. Uh, I, can, um, I can comment on that a little bit later when okay. we come back. Okay. There. Um, we don't do the race testing. Okay. It's more of a matter of if you have it or not is, is kind of been right. more of the priority right now. Uh, the other thing when you look at these plants though, look at the nodulation. Very little. There you go. Yeah. Yep. Um, that's the other thing that SCN does is it cuts down on nodulation. So even though you come out in a field and you dig it, you might not find it. I mean, I've, you can see how hard it is and the ground here is so hard. Without running quite a bit of water into a spot, I couldn't dig it up at all. So you're not going to break that dirt off of there without wrecking the roots and losing the cyst. That doesn't mean you don't have it. The only other way to test for it then is to take soil samples and send them in and have, have it looked for that way. 
Now when you're going out into a field and you're to take those soil samples, you want to look for problematic areas. Okay, you want to kind of stay in those zones. So SCN doesn't move around very readily. You know, the juvenile stage will move a little bit, but only about this far. And that's if there's some moisture involved, you know. So st stick to those areas, take 15 to 20 cores. Now normally they'll go in after harvest and just go down the row, take your probe and go kind of kitty corner into the root zone, because that's where they're going to be, is where those soybean roots were. You want 15 to 20 of those cores, mix them together in a bucket, break them apart, and then put them into a, either a Ziploc or a, a soil bag. Once you do that, you want to send them in fairly quickly. Don't throw them on the dash of your pickup. Don't throw them in the back for a week, you know. Keep them cool, treat them nice. If they get too hot, it kills that SCN, and I can't find it. It just dries up and it's gone. If you don't want to freeze those samples, you don't want to dry them out, you want to leave them just like they are. But make sure you get a good... freeze them, is it impossible to see it? <clears throat> the problem with freezing them in when they're in that small of a thing, they freeze and thaw too quickly. So if they thaw too quickly, they explode and they are, they're gone. That egg is impossible to see other than with the microscope. Right. And in the sieves that I have to go through to get to the egg, if there's too much dirt, I can't see it for the dirt. And that's what happens. So we, we usually get rid of the majority of the dirt before I even break that cyst open to get to that egg. Okay, so you don't want to freeze it. If The freezing doesn't hurt the cyst out in the field. All right, so if you're looking at it going, well, gee, that's just going to freeze and it'll be gone. No, that's not going to work. I'm just saying I've sent in samples that no, that's, that's I've thrown in the deep freeze yeah. and then I've sent them in. I mean, is it just, they're worthless then? Kind of. <laughs> I hate to say yes, but yeah, they, they really are because if, if, if they've thawed quickly, which they usually do, you know, because you're talking a small size, so yeah, you lose the cyst. If, if you let that, if you spread that sample out and let it dry, that, that's worthless too because again, that cyst is kind of a, a water-based nematode. It, it just disintegrates and is gone, you know, so. You, you want to kind of treat that sample nice, kind of like produce. You know, you, you don't want it to get too hot. You don't want it to freeze. You don't want it to dry out. But you don't want to pour water on it either. Please don't send me that muddy sample. <laughs> those are always interesting too. <coughs> so when you're sampling and you're looking for those, you're looking at lower areas of the field is typically where you're going to find that SCN. Maybe the entrance is coming in, you know, if, if you've hauled it from another field, it might have dropped off coming into the entrance. If the wind's blown it, it'll be along a fence line. So those are kind of areas you want, and you want to focus on those. Because again, SCN doesn't move very fast, very far. You know, most of the movement that happens is by, by people. You know, we're moving it on our equipment, we're moving it on our shoes, things like that. So focus in those areas. If you have a big field in several areas, take several different spots. So you might take three different samples. You only want an area about as big as 20 acres. Anything more, you're going to dilute it out and not get a good result. Okay? Um, <coughs> excuse me. You do want to watch for the low areas. Uh, the sampling bags, not too particular. You can send them in Ziplocs. You can send them in soil bags. We, we do have soil bags you can get from us. That sampling is free through our clinic. The soybean promotion is paying for all those samples, so seems like that would be a good plan in my mind. If you know you have it, you start managing it, you bring your bushels per acre up, it's just money in your pocket. Uh, the, there are resistant beans, so, and, and from what they've studies have showed, the resistance and the susceptible beans, you're going to get the same you know, if you plant a resistant beans in a field without SCN, you're going to get the same bushels per acre as, any, as a regular bean. You plant it in a field with SCN, you're going to get way more than a regular bean because the SCN is going to take out that regular bean. But you don't want to use the same resistance all the time. You want to mix that up because that nematode is going to get used to that and it's going to evolve into something that, that can handle that resistance. But there's just not, that's the problem. There's just only a couple. Ninety-six percent of the yep. gene out there. I mean, peak kings are starting to finally come in. Right. You know, so, so yeah, it is tough. Because they didn't yield the peak kings, and for a while there, they weren't that productive. Hardwigs and peak kings. 
The other thing you want to do is watch your numbers, you know, because what did you say you had up over? Well, no, there's areas in the in the valley uh, where guys didn't think they had it. Mm -hmm. And when they started sampling, this is in the Minnesota side, started sampling because the beans were looking very sickly mm -hmm. on Goodyear. Mm -hmm. And they were in that uh, anywhere between 11 to 17,000 on those fields. And where I'm at, the, the, field, the highest I've had is a little over 200, which is not fair. Which is not bad, but yeah. You want to implement with one, right? Yes. You want to start managing it as soon as you know you have it. Anything under about 5,000, you know, you can keep, stick with your regular three-year rotation. Yes. I would recommend you didn't do soybean on soybean once you know you have it. Yeah. There are guys that do still, but you're eventually going to have a lot bigger problems. Um, if he gets up over that 5,000, you might want to rotate out for more than that two, three years just to help bring that number down a little bit. You'll never get rid of SCN. Once it's in your field, it's in your field. It doesn't matter. You, you can control it, manage it, but you never get rid of it. Okay, so that's the thing you need to watch. And yeah, I don't know. If you had up over 10,000, I'd be nervous. I, I think I'd plant out of it for eight to 10 years yeah. and then, then go back in with your resistance and your a, a nice rotation. You know, you can go in with wheat and, and some of those things, the cereals, the SCN can't live on those. Um, some of the weeds they can though, so watch your sanitation. If you know you have SCN in a field, you may want to cultivate that field last and then clean your equipment and plant that field last and then clean your equipment. And a high power washer will clean that off. You want to just get rid of all the dirt on those, those pieces of equipment. If you're in with your soil probe taking samples, you want to make sure that that probe is clean before you go on to the next field. You sure don't want a little piece of soil with one cyst going into the next field and, and creating a problem there. If you want to do just, if you're just doing a visual check, you know, you've got a spot like this that looks kind of unthrifty, you want to go in about the end of July, sometime in August. That's when you, because that's by then the cyst is finally big enough to have come out of that root where you can actually see it. And you saw in that sample how small that cyst still is. I mean, she's pretty hard to see. Remember, at this point, it's going to be white. As, as that cyst grows and matures, it turns from white to yellow to a kind of a brownish color. And it's the brownish color then that overwinters or stays and, and the mature, and that's the one that's full of eggs. And when they're full of eggs, there's gonna be 500 eggs in there. So, you know, you, you, you get a lot of, lot of money for your bang. Um, to, to, I recommend when you're in the fall, you go in, you harvest your beans out, then you just follow down the row. You want to do it kind of in a zigzag pattern or maybe even a W pattern. Again, in that small 20 acre or just the, the spots where you think there's something going on, the hot spots. Up high on the hill, you're probably not going to find it. Down low in that low area, maybe where you've drug it in, those are the places to focus on. Um, you can sample any time of the year. You can sample even after your corn but usually they recommend after your soybean just to see what your numbers are. Yeah. You know, in the spring sampling, what I found is, is numbers that might have been high in a soybean field in the fall are a little bit lower in the spring. And a lot of that is, is just because your, your sampling technique is a little different. You no longer can see where the row is, so you're not so apt to be in the absolute hot spot. Now, if you're in a field, and you get to a spot that, that there's just a whole dead area. There's just nothing there, and then it starts to get a little, little bad and then a little better as you go out. Don't take samples from that very dead area. There's just not going to be anything there because there's no plants there. All right, it, it's almost like there's just too much. Get out on the borderline areas. That's where you want to sample out of. Okay, so stay out of the super hot center spot, but get into the borderline. SCN is, is an endoparasite, meaning, as you can see already, they stay inside the roots, the female, the female do, uh, which also means that if, if there's no root, there won't be any SCN. So you still want to sample that place where the root stays viable, uh, unless the cyst, the cyst can actually survive for a long time. For years. Lesion nematode, can they feed on soybeans? What is it again? Lesion. Leisha nematode is, is a ecto? corn uh, nematode, corn. it's a grass nematode, really. They're just yeah. grass Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I know they're ecto and endoparasitic. Oh. Leisha is an endoparasitic, you're right, yeah. yeah. Although uh, Tamra Jackson will, will talk more about, about that. Because they keep on talking with the Votivo and the Victa that 
There's all these, besides soybean cyst nematode, there's other nematodes that feed on soybeans. I was just wondering which ones were. They probably feed on them, they just don't do a lot of damage. You know, it's not something that, that's going to affect the bean. The other thing, one last thing about cysts that you need to remember is because our ground freezes and it's, you know, we have hard winters, it's actually good for the cyst. It keeps it from hatching when there's no, no root material there for it to, to eat on, you know, because if, if they hatch and there's nothing there, it just dies. So our hard winters are actually a good thing for cyst. And we can have two or three generations in a year because from the egg to the adult stage is 24 to 30 days. So when conditions are right, they're, they're pretty fast. Okay, any other questions? How long does that egg sac stay dormant then? Years. Okay. Yeah, you know, if, if it got tilled under, it got kind of low in the soil, you know, say you went in and plowed kind of deep and it got pushed to the bottom, it would just hang out until it got pulled back up. Because they've done where they've planted alfalfa for 10 years and still have cyst nematode. So, like I said, don't ever think that you're going to get rid of it. But they'll drop, though. I mean, if yeah, you, the numbers if will drop. drop. But you'll never yep. eradicate it. But you'll never eradicate it, exactly. Exactly. Any other questions? So, after somebody decide to, uh, to sample and send it to you, how long will it take for your lab to turn it around? Kind of depends on the number of samples I have, usually about two weeks. If, like right now, you sent in a sample, it'd be about two days because we don't get a lot of samples this time of the year. But when we're busy, it's about two week turnaround, which gives you plenty of time to figure out your management strategy. Um, you find out you have them, you're gonna go in, figure out what resistant bean you wanna use. You're also gonna look at how you're gonna clean your equipment. You know, like I said, you don't wanna be pulling it from one field into the next. If you're the agronomist, you know, pay attention to your shoes, pay attention to the equipment you're using too, the soil probes and, and those type of things. You don't want to be walking into one guy's field and then into another and spreading it for them. Yeah. High pressure washer. You got to wear these things the whole time? They look nice on you. <laughs> you well, you want, to, you want to really think about it because that cyst is very tiny. You can, you can carry it out in a very small piece of dirt. You know, you think about the, the crevices in shoes now, the soles of them. It would be very easy to carry out a hunk of dirt with one or two cysts even in, or more. So be, you know, kind of pay attention to that. We'll have to put booties on all the geese. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to see you do that. That would be fun. I'd pay money to watch him catch him. <laughs> 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 put booties on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, any other questions? Anything else I can do? If you have questions, you can always call me at the clinic too. You, um, I've got our booth is set up in the, where we're eating our meals. Uh, there's information there, there's contact information. So if you ever have a question or, or need something, just give me a holler. Hopefully my voice will be better and I won't be feeling like I'm losing it. <laughs> we did this trial starting last year and then the resistance susceptible started much earlier than that. And this is just a preliminary data. I mean, this is from one year data. We are repeating it again this year. I'm not sure if I'm gonna get a good yield data <laughs> this, this year, but we'll, we'll, we'll get some other data of, out, of, out of this, this field, which is gonna be interesting. Um, some preliminary comments. Uh, the, the, the products that we have uh, out there, only a handful of them are really targeting soybean seeds, nematode. Um, so we put together also the ones that are actually fungicides and insecticides and see how they, how they work. So you see also, you know, Apron Max, Trial X, you see Cruiser uh, in there. But we have, for example, Avicta. Avicta Complete has uh, Avermectin, uh, which is, it's insecticide, but it's also used in cattle, livestock, was, yeah, deworming. <laughs> so there you go. Deworming, soybean cyst nematode is a worm. It's just a very tiny worm. So it, 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 it's supposed to work, and, and it does. It, it does work pretty well. Um, the other product here is Poncho Fotivo. The Fotivo part is a bacillus, uh, so it's a bacteria. It, it worked rather differently than BT, you know. With BT uh, and, 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 and insects, how it works is that the bacillus thuringiensis produce a toxin and then the insect eat on it and it, it act as a, as a gut uh, poison. Bacillus firmis, I think, is what is in the fotivo part of, of Poncho Fotivo. Uh, 
honestly, we don't know what it does. It <laughs> Well, they call it barrier. <laughs> it creates barrier uh, as, as a repellent. So it, do it doesn't really produce a, a toxin. Uh, yeah, from, from, from all of the literature that are published out there that I read, honestly, we, we don't know how it works. We just know that it may work. <laughs> I, I, I think Have it you tried? Great. It does? I mean, I've done the Victa, which worked great. Mm -hmm. in field Put the Evo, yeah. Good. I've done that and it worked great. I don't and even even here, you can you can see it's uh, and I'll I'll explain that later a little bit later. It it looks like it 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 will yeah. work too. Um, and Hibit Gold is is another product that's out there. Uh, it's a harpin protein, which is again I I really don't know how that really work uh, uh, out there to to. It's just supposed to stimulate the immune system. Yeah, that that's that's how they sell it. Uh, but all of the data that I saw out there doesn't 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 have a direct uh, effect on on the soybean cyst nematode population um, but in any case this this graph right here what we did was that we replicate seven times for, for each treatments uh, we have all these plots out there we went in uh, in the beginning of the season count the number of eggs by the end of the season after harvest we went in again count the number of eggs and we divide the number of eggs by the end of the season with the number of eggs in the beginning of the season. And we call that the reproductive factor. And what it is, is just basically the way to read this graph is by looking at the line one. If it's one, it means that we have the same number of eggs by the end of the season as it, it was in the beginning of the season, meaning the population stagnates. The, the, the treatment does some work to, to, to stagnate the population. If you have anything that is higher than one, it means that the treatment doesn't do anything to, to, to suppress that population or even to keep the population at bay. If you have anything that's lower than one, then it's a pretty good deal because it, it actually decreases the number of population. Okay? All right, so first let's look at the bars. The bars are just average numbers. And, and if you're just looking at the bars, it seems like Avicta Complete does a really good job. Doesn't really surprise me much. I mean, it's a deworming agent. Should work with any worms, including soybean cyst nematode. Uh, Trilax did a, a decent job there. Trilax and Poncho Fativo and Cruiser Max did a good job. This is surprising because <laughs> Cruiser Max alone did, did a good job. <laughs> but but if you add and hit with gold, it actually it actually uh, kind of mess up the, the the performance a little bit. But here's the point that I want to I want to make too. This line, it's what we call standard deviation. The easy way to see it is that it's a measure of how consistent the result is. You have a line that is this big or that big, it means that the result is not consistent across space or across time. So if you do it in here and the county next door, it, you may have a, an inconsistent result with that particular uh, product. So the I guess right now the running conclusion would be, well, you know, I think that might work. Uh, and, and also Poncho Fativo, but the rest, they are inconsistent, and I'm, I'm not sure yet. Of course, this is just a one-year data, and we're repeating it again this year, and maybe also next year, and we'll see if we get, we get a so much better data. Here's the yield, though. So this, this one is just egg population out there. To me, where this whole thing really is meaningful is when we look at the yield. And the yield data, there's no significant difference at all <laughs> across everything, even untreated. You see it a little bit lower, but uh, if you take into account that consistency measure, the standard deviation, there's, there's no significant difference between, you know, across the board. What was your counts again, as far as out here? Uh, the number of, uh, yeah, and that, that's, For that's, ICC? yeah, well, um, it's, it was not in ten thousands, that's another oh, thing. Really? Yeah, it was in thousands. Oh, okay. One, uh, 1,500 okay. uh, at some. Uh, so it's not a crazy high pressure, but I think it's enough to tell that, all right, we, we, we probably have problem with this. And you're seeing no yield response? I, I didn't see any yield response Did last year. A resistant variety? This one is all, this one is all. All the susceptible ones to see if it made any difference? That's going to be. That's going to be right here. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh. This, this one is all susceptible. We just uh, want to know. I was just wondering if you were sticker resistant next to all them, the susceptibles in that trial to see if there's a significant difference in the yield that way. Sure, yeah, that, that's going to be interesting. But while we're talking about it, I can 
this one is just variety we didn't we didn't do any any other chemical treatment on this and what we did this is exactly the same thing as you know counting x uh, in the beginning and in the end it's in hundreds because i multiplied by 100, 100. so so it's it's just a percentage right now again so the way to read it is just this this 100 line which means that it's kind of hold the line right there the susceptible and in this what we did is that we pick out random plots and plant susceptible resistant next to each other just just really close to each other so that we can we can see direct uh, comparison in the reproductive factor the susceptible you know you, you can have four times multiplication by the end of the year and this one is an accumulative data this is not just last year this one is like four or five years in a row uh, with resistant and you already mentioned that about 90 percent of resistant varieties that we have in the midwest are p I eight eight seven eight eight. That's the ancestor. Uh, with resistance, it's pretty good. It's 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 holding up the line pretty pretty well. The yield is is different too. So the, you 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 also see that in in the yield. Yes. Um, I was just gonna see with that other one, both of them together. Yeah. So do you expect that, that one ch to the untreated to change on that one? Because what do you that, mean? Like that the reproductive factor on that is about one. Yeah. A little over one, and that one's at like four. Yeah for the, because they're both susceptible. Yeah, well, what I think what it is is that this this one is just last year's data yeah. where, where, where we have a certain number of, of uh, SEN. This one is a five-year accumulative data. So th we might have years where the, the number is mm -hmm. really, really so high. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of yeah. The take home with the resistant varieties give you the yield response. Yes. Over the treatment. Yes. Uh, at least from, from this data, that, that, that will be my take home. Uh, that the system variety should be your first line of defense. Uh, somebody mentioned um, race uh, and SEN. As I as I understand it, they they start to go away a little bit from race. Type, yeah. yeah, and and move into what they call HG type. Uh, Heterodirect license is the Latin name for soybean cis nematode, so HG type. If you really want to, you can send your sample to be HG type at University of Illinois. I think it costs $250. Well, the seed companies still refer to it all as race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking at an R3, um, which means that less than 10% of the race 3 can develop on there. Yep, yep. So what HG type does, it, I, I like the HG type, HG typing a little bit better because what it is is that it looks into all of the soybean ancestral i think we have six or seven uh, sources of resistance that we breed into our soybean up here and pi 88788 is, is is one and it's it's, it's very much used picking is another one cloud hardwick is another one so they, they they took your sample and they tested on on each of those ancestors and then they come up with which one has been can be broken by, by your uh, population. So they come up with, all right, your HG type is against PI 788, against cloud, against this. And, and, and that kind of tell you, all right, so probably I shouldn't plant soybean varieties that has been bred out of this ancestral lines. So I like that it, it, it costs money. <laughs> if, if, and then for me, I think University of Illinois is probably the only one who still does that. Uh, now or maybe Ohio State, but we don't we don't do it. We don't have the resource to do it uh, at, at SDSU. It takes a couple of months to actually finish well, the whole lines just the came whole thing. Illinois, right? yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's that. Um, so what I usually tell people is that you know if you've been planting your system uh, soybean, just keep on sending us your sample, and we'll be able to tell whether you have a, a trend of increasing or or stagnating or, or decreasing population of, of SEN. It should be at least stagnating. If you, every year after planting resistance soybean, you still have an increasing population, that's, that is uh, an indicator that, that uh, your population there is probably able to break that resistance. And at that point, it's probably time to rotate your resistance lines to something else, if, if something else available. I think that uh, Picking is starting to it's starting to, I mean, to, to trickle right. in. It's uh, starting to actually yield now. Yep. Um, 
the seed catalogs, any seed catalogs, uh, do not do a very good job at telling you what is the what is the ancestor lines. But I think the seed traps can can tell you about that. They they, they should know all those information. Uh, any other question about SCN? If not, I have few things that I need to share with you. Have you gone through the the entomologist yet? So you've seen this? No. I thought they're gonna give it away. Maybe not. Well, first, uh, all this data, we have it. Well, that data is not out there yet, just because it's only one year. I need to repeat it so that I know what I'm putting out there. Uh, but this data is is is. There you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, this data is is on iGro, uh, which is our online presence from STSU, iGro.org. Um, and, and all of our field research data will, will eventually make their way uh, onto iGro. If you, if you need some of those data, it will be available there. Uh, this is yet another online resource that, that we have. <coughs> what it is is um, a series of articles on different pests and diseases. It's called northernplainsipm.org or npipm.org. Um, it's free. Uh, it's a resource that we developed together with other entomologists and and uh, and plant pathologists in the in the area. It has information on picture ID and how to scout and all those good stuff. Uh, and the other thing that I like about it is that it's not only online; it's also available as an app. So if you have a smartphone, Apple, Android, whatever, uh, you can download it. Uh, it's still called an NPIPM, I'm quite sure, uh, the, the app. And uh, if, if you download that, it's going to live in your gadget. <laughs> and you don't need internet connection to, to check it out. For now, uh, the online site has corn and soybean insects. The soybean disease chapter will be up next week or in two weeks at, at the very latest. And then after that, we're going to do a, a, an update on the, on the app. All right, if there's no more question. I'm happy to pass it to uh, Tamara Jackson. Tamara is an extension corn pathologist uh, from University of Nebraska, and she knows so much more about corn nematode than, than I do. Don't say it like that. That, well. <laughs> that creates a lot of high expectations. Good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here from the University of Nebraska, where I have statewide responsibility for diseases of corn and grain sorghum. And for me and my appointment, that includes diseases caused by nematodes of corn. And so I wanted to spend some time talking to you today about why we expect more problems and think we're seeing more problems caused by nematodes in corn and what we might be able to do about some of those problems. Already today, you've heard a lot of information about the soybean cyst nematode, and that, in, that nematode is extremely important to us in soybean production. But that's probably the only nematode that you've heard very much about during recent years in our row crops. And so we want to talk about nematodes in corn and remind you that this is not a new problem by any means. This problem is actually, it's a very old problem actually, going back for several decades. And so many of you knew maybe grandpa had a nematode field, and so that's what we hear quite a bit. I want to remind you, though, that nematodes in corn, they've been here a long time, and they're actually native to the Midwest. These were problems originally during, these nematodes were here during the days when we had prairie. They didn't create a problem, though, because we had a diversity of plant species in that ecosystem. We kind of mess things like that up, though, when we start monoculturing and selecting for some of the pests and nematodes that can feed on corn. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today. Well, nematodes were managed a lot more heavily more decades ago. We used a lot of soil insecticides, for instance, ones that may have been carbamates and organophosphates, some of the really nasty, toxic products. Well, you may not realize it, nor our producers, that they may have been controlling nematodes all along too, because those same products had secondary nematicidal activity. And so those were benefits that we got from those products. Well, 
we've got a lot more interest in nematodes now because it kind of died off for a couple of decades there. As corn prices were reduced and we didn't have insecticide boxes on planters as much anymore, we didn't have a way to control them. And so we ignored them for a couple of decades and a lot of farmers haven't thought about it. Now we've got a renewed interest in nematodes in corn for a lot of different reasons. And the first reason is that you folks are doing a great job managing all the other corn cropping practices and management. And so things like other pest management practices like our insect management. We have a great list of herbicides too, so we are controlling her weeds better than we ever have. And nutrient management practices. And so people always considered nematodes to be something that was nickel and diming them in most cases. And now we're starting to pay closer attention to some of those different things. Many of you are aware though that nematodes are a major problem for some of our producers and the worst problem some of them are actually dealing with. And so it's only been recently that we've also had new products become available, new tools in our toolbox to try to manage some of these nematodes. And so some of the renewed interest in nematodes and nematode management is industry driven. Some of the new products that we have available are seed treatment nematicides coming available for the first time ever in history where we've had seed treatment fungicides and seed treatment insecticides available for many years. In addition, some of our older products like Ambax Counter is still available to us and now we have new tools for application of that using some of their say smart box technology that many of you may have heard about. Finally, commodity prices are very high right now and when our commodity prices are high our producers are even more eager to try to capture as much yield as they can and protect their crop from any of those little nuisance nickel and diming problems they thought they had all along and so we've got a lot of interest now in learning more about nematodes and how to control them well unfortunately we have changed a lot of things in our corn cropping practices that while they are helping us produce a lot higher quality and more quantity of corn, they may also be helping nematode and nematode survival and infection. So let's talk about a few of those. Some of the things that we've changed recently, like our changes in insecticide chemistries. We have transitioned more away from those traditional organophosphates and carbamate products to more pyrethroid insecticides and the neonicotinoids that are much more common now. Even ones that are soil insecticides we're starting to use more of. The bad news is, is that those pyrethroids and neonics are not expected to have the secondary nematicidal activity that many of our producers decades ago appreciated about the old insecticides. These products are safer for us and them to handle, but they're also safer for nematodes. Nematodes, in fact, are a little bit more closely related to our biology than they are to other insects. And so you might think about that and how these products, safer for us, safer for nematodes too. Number two, we've reduced insecticide use, soil insecticide use altogether anyway. And transitioned more to more trans transgenic insect resistance. So like the corn rootworm genetics. Well, that's not effective against nematodes either. The large BT protein is a very complex and large, physically large molecule. And the nematodes that we're talking about are microscopic and their mouth parts are very, very small. And so they're not able to take up some of those proteins. Whether or not they're toxic to them is a whole separate issue. And so if they're not going to take it up, it's not going to be effective and they're not helping us with our nematodes. And so nematodes are continuing to feed and reproduce. Finally, in our state, we're seeing a transition back to more continuous corn again, abandoning some of our crop rotations. Now that doesn't mean that you can control nematodes by crop, ro crop rotation, but sometimes you can. And even nematodes with a wide host range might prefer having corn than some of the other crops because they can reproduce to higher population densities. If you don't remember anything, one of the take home messages I want you to have from this talk is to remember 
there are three facts about corn nematodes because we're dealing with a lot of misconceptions right now among our producers and what they've been led to believe or think about nematode damage. Three things in particular. The first one, you've just learned a lot about soybean cyst nematode earlier in this session and that's talking about a single species of nematode a very important species of nematode. Now in contrast to that, in corn, we have more than one dozen species of nematodes that we're talking about. And the problem is these nematodes are very diverse. And so they're as different as the insects, the many different species of insects that you're dealing with. But we tend to lump nematodes under an umbrella and all together when they are very, very different. Second, this is a big one for us. Many of our producers believe that you don't have a problem with corn nematodes in any of your fields except the ones that are sandy. Well, there's only a teeny bit of truth to that. We find nematodes, and I mean the plant parasites, the bad guys, in every single field. Well, you've also got good guys out there too, very, very beneficial nematodes that are eating other fungi and feeding on insect larvae and even eating each other and the bad guys like plant parasites. Number three, most people believe, unfortunately, that nematode damage is rare. And so the other thing is that the damage that they cause, the types of symptoms, they're not diagnostic, and so they're difficult to diagnose, meaning that they're often overlooked or misdiagnosed altogether because the symptoms they cause look like things that you see every day, things that may be caused by insect injury or compaction or any other pH issues that are out there, or even some of our common insects like wireworm damage. And so my point today is to make sure that when you leave here that you have added nematodes to your list of possible causes of a problem, especially when you're going out to troubleshoot a field. I mentioned that we have more than a dozen species of nematodes in corn. These are a partial list of the common names of some of those nematodes. And so you've got examples like needle and sting and dagger and lance and stubby root. And if, if you can think of a weapon, I bet there's a nematode named after it. And so you can see that up here. The other thing I want to remind you is that each one of these represents a single genus. And so there are often multiple species of some of these nematodes that can affect corn, like lesion nematode or root lesion nematode down here at the bottom. We know of six different species of lesion nematode that can feed on corn. In the Midwest, we know of at least three of those that we have, three species of lesion nematode. The bad news about that is some of those species can also feed on soybean or other crops, have a wider host range. When you look at this list, you'll notice that nematologists tend to group things according to how they eat or what they eat. And in this case, we have lumped these into two basic categories. The top category, it's about two thirds of these, are called ectoparasites. And these are the nematodes that feed on the outside of the roots. And so in the picture on the right, you can see the surface of that root and two nematodes on the outside feeding. Well, these and all the other plant parasites feed by using a structure in their head called a stylet. And it's a hollow structure. In many cases, it's hollow and has a pointed sharp end. And they use that as a structure or an apparatus to puncture root cells. And they suck out some of the contents that they use to feed on. And they also use it to inject certain negative compounds, things like enzymes, like charismate mutase. Soybean cyst nematode, for instance, uses charismate mutase to interrupt the plant's natural defense response. And so that's an important way that we're just now understanding better how soybean cyst nematode works. Well, we're decades behind on research for corn nematodes. And so if any of these nematodes have that capability, we don't know it yet. The second category I want to bring your attention to up here are the endoparasites. Lance and lesion nematodes are endoparasites because they spend part, if not their entire lives, inside corn roots. 
not necessarily just feeding from the outside, which they can do as well. And so when you look in the lower right hand corner, you can see this nematode wound up inside that root and there's the stylet feeding on some of those root cells. And so thinking about how to determine if you have a nematode problem, you know that you're going to have to collect samples and submit it to a lab for processing. Well now, knowing that many of these nematodes can survive inside roots, you need to have a lab that's going to process samples and process to get out the nematodes that are both in the soil and in the root systems to get the best, most accurate response. It's especially important, I'll tell you, because lesion nematode is thought by nematologists in the Midwest to be the one that cumulatively causes the most damage to corn. The reason we believe that is, after a survey that we conducted in 2007, we learned that over 80% of the corn fields in the Midwest have lesion nematodes in them, 80%. Even scarier is that in Nebraska alone, in more than 93% of the fields in our state, we have lesion nematodes at some level. That doesn't mean that all the fields have a problem with lesion or other nematodes. It just means that they're there and extremely common. And simply by their widespread distribution, that's why we think lesion nematode is causing the most damage cumulatively. Do you have a sample for them? versus soybeans is in the fall after the plant's dried up and dead, where with corn it's got to be on a living plant, right, for sampling? Most part. So for those of you who couldn't hear the question, we've got a question about sample timing for, say, lesion nematodes and endoparasites. All nematodes are obligate parasites, and so they have to feed and reproduce on living tissue. But sampling for nematodes in corn is different, and so Soybean cyst nematode can be sampled any time of year because it stays in the upper 8 or 10 inches of the soil. Most corn nematodes do as well, although some of those nematodes, two in particular, can go very deep in the soil. Those two nematodes actually require sandy soil, and so what our recommendation is, is if you have a sandy field, we recommend sampling it for nematodes early in the season, say by V4 or V6 when you know your roots are still in that upper 8 to 12 inches or so. That means you're more likely to capture them in the sample you collect. If your field is any other soil texture, anything heavier than an 80% sand, we say that it's okay to wait until har after harvest because those other nematodes tend to stay in that upper 8 to 10 inches like soybean cyst. And so if you wait until after harvest, when you're already out there collecting samples for nutrient analysis, we recommend collecting additional soil to that and then just splitting it up and sending it on for separate analyses. That's a good question, thank you. And so in addition, while we're talking about sampling, we recommend that you sample within the root zone. That's gonna require you to sample within the row with your soil probe to a depth of 8 to 10 inches if you can get it in there that deep. You should be close enough that you'll hear those roots popping as you push it down through there. And that's good because that's where the nematodes are going to be and where you're going to most likely catch them. Something else you should keep in mind is we need these nematodes alive. And so you need to treat them as such and be careful handling and sampling. Some nematodes can be damaged during handling and sampling. If you're too rough with them, they can actually burst. Others can be killed, too. The ones that are inside the roots and are extracted have to be alive and crawl out on their own. And so it takes several additional days of extraction to do that. Other nematodes from the soil, we can extract them any time. But what we recommend in handling these samples, to keep them cool, don't allow them to get too hot or, or to freeze either to keep those nematodes alive. So I would recommend that you treat them like you would your night crawlers when you go fishing. Don't let them sit out in the sun, keep them in a cooler, refrigerate if possible, and put them in plastic bags too to keep them fresh. If you sample a field, whether it's sandy or not, by V4 to V6, go ahead and collect some root balls too. And so your lab has the option of collecting either the root fragments out of the soil, which is what our lab does, but if we receive root balls, we also extract them from that separately as well. And so for the same price, you can normally do that. 
most of all you should probably check with the lab that you intend to submit a sample to and make sure that's what they're going to do and what they need though excellent question thank you and we by the way we need a minimum of about two cups of soil for the corn nematode extraction and that gives us enough to run it twice if we need to okay excellent question any more about sampling all right let's move on now we mentioned earlier that a lot of people think that nematodes are only in sandy soil well let me show you why that's not true and so this is a diagram showing the relative sizes and shapes of these nematodes next to each other. Now how many of you have seen soybean cyst nematode in this session or before? Did you see that this time? Excellent, that's good. So you were able to see those nematodes with your naked eye, right? Magnification helps, but they are a little, they're small, but they're big enough that you can see them. Well, what you saw was a female soybean cyst nematode like this one in the lower right hand corner. Just know that those are lemon shaped females. And so they're more round in shape and they're colored. They're white to yellow and eventually turn brown. Well, when you compare her to all the other nematodes up here, you're going to notice that we have a lot of nematodes that are a lot larger or longer than her. For example, needle nematode up here at the top and notice that that nematode is actually folded in half. Now, if that nematode was stretched out and wrapped around the back side of this board, you can't see this scale from where you're at, but I'll tell you, she would be up to almost a quarter of an inch long. But you're never gonna see them hanging off of roots like what you saw with soybean cyst, because these nematodes are thin and what we call vermiform or worm shaped, very thin, and they're not colored, they're not white or yellow like soybean cyst. At their best, you might see them in a dish of water that we've prepared and they look like white eyelashes and they're swimming around. These are microscopic nematodes, but that one is enormous compared to all the others. Well, it's those enormous nematodes like needle and sting up here at the top of the diagram that require sandy soil. Those are the nematodes that need the large pore spaces between the sand grains to help them move around in the soil. The rest of these nematodes don't have a preference for texture. At least they don't need it. Needle and sting need at least 80% sand. Now here's lesion nematode nearly at the bottom down here. And look how small that nematode is compared to some of these big ones. Well, we said lesion nematode was in over 80% of our cornfields in the Midwest. Well, that's because it doesn't prefer sand over some of the others. We can have them in any soil texture because they are so small, okay? Something to keep in mind, you likely have nematodes in your field, the bad guys, the plant parasites. And in fact, I would expect to find something in samples that you've submitted. When we don't find something, we rerun them because we assume that there was a mistake made during extraction. Whether or not you have a problem with nematodes is determined by which ones you have and how many there are. And so you have to leave that up to the lab that you're working with to identify that. So now that you know the nematodes that are a possibility, Let's talk about whether or not they cause damage and how bad it might be. And so the relative damage risks are listed in order up here, and these nematodes have been assigned to different categories. Well, the highest risk, the baddest of the worst damage that you can get are caused by needle and sting nematodes. Remember, those are the large nematodes that we see in sandy soil. And in those fields where they occur, you may only need two to five to have major problems caused by them. Just a couple out there. And these nematodes can cause damage that may look a lot like wireworm, for instance, causing really severe root damage and necrosis. The good news about them is that they are really uncommon, and you might even say rare, and you're not going to likely run into them very often. And if you do, you might get a call from me when we see your results come back, because we should talk about it. The second group, moderate and actually the bottom one, are much more likely to be in your fields, and you're going to find them, or we will when we process your samples or somebody. That group in the middle, 
like lesion nematode lance and stubby root, they can cause substantial injury, but it takes a lot more of them to do that. You might have several hundred out there to get the same type of damage or maybe thousands to see what you might see up here. You're gonna find some in every field though, and maybe not that many. The bottom category, low or undetermined risk. We have a long way to go to learn about some of these species and what their host ranges are and how many it really takes to cause damage. Well, things like stunt and dagger, they're very common. We actually have another species of stunt called Quinocelsius. It's out in western Nebraska we see more commonly. Spiral nematode is very common. We see it in some of our heavier clay soils, heavier silt loams, very, very commonly. And in fact, we can see up to three or five thousands of those nematodes in fields that easily produce more than 200 bushels. So it's hard to think that they're causing too much injury even at those levels. In fact, some nematologists actually believe that having a few of those nematodes might be a good thing because that minute damage that they cause promotes additional root branching and root growth. And so some of these nematodes are much less of a concern than others. And you have to leave that up to the lab that you're working with to help you determine that. Well, let's look at some of the damage that we're talking about and how bad can it be? This picture was taken in Northwest Illinois in Whiteside County. And obviously this is needle nematode injury based on the label. And what you've got out here is a large patch in the field, it, up to half an acre, it's not really that large. The corn around that patch is probably shoulder to chest high on me, but the corn in the middle of that spot's very short, six or eight inches tall. But when you dig up those plants, you'll notice there's really not many roots left on there. And so, collecting a sample in the middle, we found no nematodes out there. Where would you sample if you had a spot that was this bad? Border. Exactly. You want to sample around the border of a spot, because that's where you're more sli most likely to find nematodes. And so, the, the plants that are just starting to show some symptoms is where you're more likely to see those, if you have a spot this bad. In addition, though, I would also encourage you to step away from this and go several feet out into the corn near there that appears healthy and collect a, sep a second sample for c comparison purposes. And so that way it can help us identify whether or not that was caused by nematodes and possibly eliminate them if they were similar with populations. The good news about needle nematode, again, you don't see very many of them. More good news is, this nematode is a grassy nematode. Gr grassy host species like corn and sorghum and other weedy species are what it prefers. Simply rotating with soybean will help you do a good job knocking its numbers down. Whoop. Well, sting nematode can cause similar types of injury, but I would argue that it's much worse. This particular picture was made in Holt County, Nebraska, and so if you folks know where O'Neill is, it's just west of there. This is the worst I had ever seen, and you could not see or get this whole spot in a single picture because it was over 10 acres. And what we learned was there was over 100 sting nematodes per cup of soil, or 100 cc's of soil, and in this case, Sting nematode is a real problem because it has a wide host range. That includes corn and soybean and just about anything you would intend to plant out there except for alfalfa. But in the irrigated sand hills of Nebraska, people, most of them are not going to be willing to rotate to alfalfa. But simply by rotating to soybean, there may be enough benefits to help reduce the numbers. Most likely, you'd have to use multiple management strategies to help you offset some of this damage, maybe the use of a nematicide out there as well. The good news is that you're not likely to run across sting and needle. It is much more likely that if you run across a nematode problem field, it's gonna look something like this. And you wouldn't get too bent out of shape just coming up on this field. You might be able to see a few yellow patches out there, maybe a little bit stunted. 
And when I spoke to the farmer about it, he said, well, that's probably drought damage. This is a sandier part of the field. They aren't getting enough moisture. And he was working on the pivot, getting ready to fire it up. But when we dug around in the soil, we found moisture below the surface, but we didn't find enough roots left and rootlets left on that, those plants to actually use that moisture. And when we ran the nematode samples, what we found was is that we had a zoo's worth of nematodes out there in that field, and some of them were actually quite high. What you can't see in the picture that I can see are orange stakes out here. This is actually a picture of one of our nematicide trials in 2006. And so we had a trial placed out there and with a lot of nematode pressure, and we'll share, share that with you soon. In that same field, when we returned at harvest in the fall and dug up some more roots to take a closer look, we saw a lot of lesions on those roots. Some of those lesions are more obvious than others. A lot of discoloration. The biggest problem in that field in that part was with root lesion nematode. And remember, that nematode is a migratory endoparasite. So once it gets in, it continues to move. So think about the microscopic level of damage that you're seeing and the wounds that are opened up to allow secondary infection. Because actually, some of these lesions look more like rhizoctony or fusarium infection to me. And remember, that's the nematode that is very, very common. In this field, and actually this root ball, once we chopped it up and extracted them out, we had more than 2,000 root lesion nematodes per gram of root. And so huge, huge numbers out there. And on this picture on the bottom, you can make out that style it a little bit better there under the microscope. I mentioned to you earlier that the best time to sample for nematodes might be in the spring, especially if you have sandy fields. Well, here's a data set that will hopefully help convince you of that. And these data are from Dr. Ann McGoodwin at the University of Wisconsin, where she had a field that was infested with both the needle nematode and the root lesion nematode. She sampled during two times of year, in May and in September, at five different depths down to about 16 inches. And what she found in May was that she had both needle nematodes and root lesion nematodes were predominantly mostly in that upper 8 to 10 inches that you can see most of them up here and up here. But by the time she returned in September to resample that field, she realized that most of the needle nematodes had shifted down to that 14 or 12 to 14 inch range out of reach of many of our traditional soil probes. And so if you were sampling shallow, you may have missed those nematodes altogether. But root lesion nematodes stayed predominantly in the upper 8 to 10 inches, so we would have easily caught those. And this is why we recommend sampling sandy fields that could have needle or sting nematodes in the spring at V4 to V6. Okay, in your packet, you've got quite a few slides that we didn't have time to share with you today. So let's look at a few of those. What do you do if you've got a nematode problem? What are your options? I wanted to talk to you about that a little bit and talk about some of the new products that have come available. Some of those products are seed treatment nematicides. And we've got three that have come labeled recently. And so the first one that became available to you was from Syngenta Crop Protection, and that's Avicta. And it's sold as a package of Avicta Complete Corn that includes seed treatment fungicides and the insecticide Cruiser. Well, this product is a traditional pesticide, and the active ingredient is abamectin. And so you might recognize that if you have experience working with livestock dewormers, like the Ivermec products. And it shouldn't surprise you, because those same nematodes you're trying to control, those, those intestinal parasites, those are nematodes just like the ones we're trying to control in the field here in corn. And so the same class of compounds is effective against those, and that's abamectin.
And so it does come with a warning label. But since it is isolated to the seed as a seed treatment, we're not broadcasting it and using a lot of the product. So the risk for exposure is much lower than in other ways we've used some nematicides in the past. The second product I've got listed on that page is Poncho Votivo. This product is from Bayer Crop Science, and Votivo is the nematicide component of that package, Poncho being the insecticide component that it's packaged with now. Well, the Votivo nematicide here is a much different product than Evicta that we talked about before. This product is actually a biological product, and that organism is a bacterium called Bacillus firmus. And actually, it's a specific isolate or individual of that bacterium called I-1582 that was identified and isolated in Europe. In the early stages of development of this product, both bear crop science and several nematologists across the Midwest, we all got together at RTP in North Carolina and discussed our results and why we thought we were seeing some effects. And actually, we were unsure why or how this product was working, and it appeared it could be related to some kind of a barrier it was producing, but it could also be because this product, this organism, is one of several that have been identified as plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, PGPRs. And in other plant systems, we've shown that those bacteria can cause or induce some plant benefits, some characteristics of improved plant growth and health of the root system. And so there's the potential for that effect in there as well. The third product that has been labeled is Acceleron HX209, and that's from Monsanto. And so you might recognize that the Acceleron name refers to the, their lineup, complete lineup of seed treatments. This one, HX209, specifically refers to the nematicide. This product is, again, very different from the other two we have mentioned. This is actually a protein called the Harpin Alpha Beta Protein. In other plant systems, historically, plant pathologists have used Harpin proteins because some of them are able to induce a systemic acquired resistance in the plant. So it's not a pesticide, it's a protein. And so what they've noticed is, is that some of those plants become more resistant to other pests and sometimes nematodes in this case. Unfortunately, this product is not commercially available yet, uh, except for from other companies who have picked up the Harpin protein using it as a foliar or in furrow spray not available from Monsanto at this time. Do you think inhibit's going to, or harpin protein? Inhibit. Is That's the other one, yes. Yeah, is it, um, is it doing it? We really I have no it? idea. We have zero data. We've never been allowed to test it's that product. Because research from uh, soybean system is showing nothing. It's showing nothing, that's right. So we don't have any way of knowing if that'll be the case for corn nematodes or not, too. We do have some results, though, with both Evicta and Votivo that were positive, yeah. although not every year. And so some of those results are also in your packet. We have a lot more available on our website where you can see how it behaved in other environments. The best example we have was from 2006 from the field I showed you earlier. That's from this field in North Bend, Nebraska of our nematicide plots. The red bar graph you see, these are yield data. And this is in that irrigated field that we showed you. To help you interpret how to read some of these graphs, I want to show you the left-hand bar on the, right, on the left side is the seed treatment fungicides alone. The one just next to that are the combination of the fungicides and cruiser insecticide. This one is a Syngenta trial. And then there are four different rates of Evicta on the right-hand side of that or counter added on top of that seed treatment fungicide cruiser combination. Okay, during this year, we saw a yield increase with every one of these nematicides used, including counter, in addition to the traditional fungicides and cruiser. Now, you know already this is in a location that has obvious documented nematode pressure. And so we knew we had a problem out there. And in, in addition, that field this year also had some additional stress. We had some moisture stress out there and, and others. And so 
We saw benefits with the products during that year, although they were not statistically different, even though some of them had very large yield increases. That's an indicator of the immense variability you get when trying to work with nematode populations like this. You'll notice you have hot spots in fields where nematode populations at their highest are randomly aggregated in the field. That's why you see those patches. Well, that makes replication and research a, a nightmare in trying to interpret it, and that's why you see the variability is high enough that you don't always get the statistics to turn up. On the following pages, you'll see there's also results with the nematicide Votivo and additional trials with Evicta. In the presence of heavy nematode pressure, we've seen benefits with these products. Sometimes in the same field, though, during a year when we don't have stress, we have beautiful, wonderful growing conditions, the plants are able to outgrow some of that damage. And during that environment, we think we're not seeing some of those, some of those effects of the treatments. And so we don't consistently see them if we have good growing conditions. I would encourage you to go online and check out some of those other nematicide trial results on our website. The website address is at the end of your handout at Plant Disease Central, pdc.unl.edu. The last thing I want to share with you is that I have a copy of the label for counter, the insecticide nematicide. I included this because more recently we've started to use some of our more conventional herbicides again, trying to minimize the potential for resistance development, like glyphosate resistance that we're getting a lot of in Nebraska. The counter insecticide has a specific phrase in the label that a lot of people aren't aware of, and it points out the potential for a herbicide interaction with this product. And so we wanted to point that out because we have seen that in some of our own trials where we inadvertently treated with some of the same herbicides and we saw quite a bit of stunting and negative effects with some of our very common herbicides. So I just want to point that out for anybody who's using these products. That is a potential and AMVAC has come out with a technical bulletin listing some of those common herbicides to watch out for if you're using this product. So. That concludes the material I brought for you. Do you have any questions about nematodes of corn or soybean cyst nematodes? We've still got your speakers available from the previous half. No questions. I think I've filled them to the gills with uh, nematodes. Well, they're out there, but you won't know whether or not they're causing a problem without sampling. And in many cases, that's a cheap way to eliminate one more possibility. So I would encourage you to sample if you have any doubts or concerns about, about nematodes. Thank you very much for coming. And I think we'll be here through lunch today in the last session. So if you had any more questions pop up, we'll be happy to answer those while we're here. One practical question: We don't we don't do the uh, corn nematode. And you probably touched this. I uh, we don't do the corn nematode uh, uh, counting or ID in, in mm -hmm. South Dakota in our clinic. So we usually send it to you. Yes. So uh, how much will do you guys charge for for that? We do actually. And so to repeat the question. Uh, at the moment, SDSU does not have a lab that is processing nematode samples for corn nematodes. Now, the corn nematodes, it's not that they're that different to process for. These are just regular vermiform nematode samples. Right now, our lab at the University of Nebraska is working well with uh, SDSU, trying to help get those nematode samples processed. And if they come to the University of Nebraska Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic, it's going to cost you $25 per sample. And that will include analysis of both the nematodes in the soil and either the root fragments or the root balls, or both if you send those to us. Just be sure to make sure and be gentle with those samples. Don't toss them around. Ship them earlier in the week so that they get there and don't spend the weekend in the post office getting too hot or too cold, okay? Is there a form we fill out? Yes, there is actually. And if you go to that website, Plant Disease Central, on that back page of your handout, pdc.unl.edu, there is a link to the UNL Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic in the lower left-hand corner of there. And that will lead you to the sample submission form that you can print out online and then fill out by hand. Please stick that in the box with the sample. Okay, very, very good question. Thank you. Yes? Um, 
In one of my bio classes at Augie, they talked about how if you took away like all the dirt and plants and everything, you could still see the shape of the earth just with nematodes? Yes. So when you're going through these samples, do you have to sort through quite a few other just random non-harmful? That's an awesome question. And so, so what he's talking about is that nematodes are the most common multicellular organism on earth and so they're the most common animal easily and so in addition all we have talked about today are plant parasites the bad guys there are a lot of good beneficial nematodes in the soil too and yes it takes somebody who's been trained in how to recognize those nematodes and differentiate between good guys and bad guys we tend to only report the bad guys because that's what people tend to care about the most. And so that's an excellent question. Nematodes are actually a diverse and very well adapted group of animals because they are in every single ecosystem on Earth from the very low pH depths of the ocean and those sulfur vents down at the bottom into Antarctica too. So they're well adapted to their environments wherever they are. Great question. It's a good biology question. I like that. So when, they, when, they, when people send in a, a farm nematode sample of the ID, uh, how long will it take you to okay. turn it around? Turning around a nematode sample for corn is different from soybean. Soybean cyst samples are relatively easy to run. They're fast. You can run them and get out what you need in, in one series of steps. It takes us longer with corn nematodes, and so I think what uh, Connie was saying earlier, depending on the backlog of samples that we're dealing with and you folks have at SDSU, I know it can take as little as a day or it might take a couple weeks to catch up on those. For us, for corn nematode analysis, it's a minimum of two weeks. And that's because it takes a full week alone just to allow the nematodes to crawl out of those root samples because it is such a slow process. And so um, it might take a month or more to get those turned around if we have a backlog. And part of the backlog problem is that in our lab and most of the others that process these samples, there's usually only one or, in our case, two people that can count and differentiate between those. And we literally count them under the microscope, sliding it along. And sometimes, yes, moving trash around to look at them or other nematodes out of the way to see. And so it is quite laborious and takes a very special person willing and able to do that for several hours. In our lab, I'm the second person that can do that and I'm never there. And so that leaves one gal to do that. And so she's also one of my field technologists doing a lot of work outside. And so it really depends on the time of year. Keeping in mind though, you can't do anything during the season anyway and get effective results. And so what you're doing is sampling ahead of time to make plans for the f next year or years later when you do come back to corn. Decisions like that need to be made in the fall probably if you're going to use a seed treatment or insecticide in the spring when you plant. Good question. Um, one more. Um, mm -hmm. do, we, do, do we see natural predators with them? And oh. Is there certain things that you spray that will kill the predators but not the nematodes or whatever? Another excellent question. Nematodes do have some natural predators. There are a number of little microorganism, invertebrate organisms that do feed on them. There are also some other nematodes that are predatory and f they feed on each other too. And so having a balance of those is important to n the natural ecosystem. But as far as I know, we're not aware of anything that has direct negative effects on a wide geographic area of them. In a small area, and, and it's, it's a difference in, in magnitude in thinking about it, and repetition in that we have so many of these organisms throughout the soil. It, you know, a tablespoon of soil has more living organisms than probably most of the state does. Because of that diversity, we assume that there's enough there to recover and provide that. Uh, a general biocide would certainly have negative effects. You've all heard probably of methyl bromide. That's a general biocide. And some of the other cotton nematicides are general biocides used in furrow. That would kill everything, a little zone of death there. But 
and as little as a couple inches away, you probably have others to pick up the slack there. Yeah, I was just wondering because like certain, like with the spider mites, if you spray something, it'll kill their yeah. natural predators and not them and cause a flare up. I was exactly. And if it is, we haven't documented it yet with research. That's a good question. I like people are thinking about the bigger picture and what the potential negative impacts are. That's absolutely correct. Good. Anybody else? You guys have been a great group. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. And people never call us if something, everything's going right. They only call when you have a problem. So I'll wish for you that you don't need to call. But if you do have a problem, we're always here to help you. You have a lot of wonderful experts at South Dakota State University. And we all work very well together, I think, and sharing information and helping however we can. So.